Things fall apart. Hard advice oh. for difficult times by Pema Shodron. <laughs> Sorry, can you say that name again? No. <laughs> Never again. That was it. That was the one time I'm going to say it, this whole book club. Uh, um, bad at pronunciation. So we're just doing the introduction and chapter one today while we kind of introduce ourselves to this new book. Uh, they are very short, so while many of you may or may not have read it, you won't be missing too terribly much. <laughs> So Pema opens up by giving us an interesting set of context for why she wrote the book in the first place, which is that she kind of set out to do a year of nothing mm. um, and use the time to reflect and write. And so this book kind of gets written during that time, uh, at least segments of it, chunks of it. Um, and then she thinks about like, one of the things she does is, as she's interested in the, the book itself through the introduction is that reflecting on her always coming back to my, my tree, the loving kindness, kindness towards oneself. And that oftentimes a lot of subjects and material bring her back to this. Um, and then when she goes out to teach or, and stuff, right? So she says, gradually, as I read more, I began to see that in some way, no matter what subject I had chosen, what country I was in, or what year it was, I had taught endlessly about the same things. The great need for Maitra, loving kindness towards oneself, and develop, and then, you know, developing from that, the awakening of a fearlessly compassionate attitude, which I continue to love the thread that, um, that she follows with that in her books, um, the places that scare you that we went over particularly stands out in my mind in regards to that. I'm a big fan of Pema's. Uh, I know some people in book club are not as big of fans, so I do apologize, but her <laughs> book is in fact one of the top two books that won the vote. <laughs> so I win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you win. I win. Wait, has, has other people said they don't like <laughs> Besides some things I've said, which I was still like, yeah, I do want, I want. Um, yeah, I, just not everybody's as big a fan of the writing style. I think like no, I haven't had a ton of major complaints about choosing Pema books, but uh, definitely, I think I am the bigger fan girl. <laughs> so yeah, her introduction is real short. One of the things that. I, I highlighted here was in putting these instructions into practice we join a long lineage of teachers and students who have made the buddha dharma relevant to the ups and downs of their ordinary lives i really liked this sentiment um i wanted to highlight it because as always i think it's really easy to approach mindfulness and meditation and like overly glorified it as this little fancy spectacle that you're going to be putting on and then just kind of stepping back and realizing that it's just adding it to the ordinariness and that you are just one of bazillions of people. I'm not going to use a real number. Uh, <laughs> bajillion bazillions of people who've approached this practice. You know, I don't, I like the simplicity of it. I like the realization that I'm a piece of something ongoing, but not necessarily overly showboaty. I'm having a difficult time with my vocabulary today and I apologize. <laughs> Does anybody That's have any okay. thoughts? If I say no, does that mean I've achieved Dharmakaya? No. In fact, you you failed and you have to start oh, over. Shit. Fuck. <laughs> Off to rebirth with you. Off to rebirth with you. <laughs> no. <laughs> Re-enter the circle. Go. No. <laughs> um, she starts with intimacy with fear as chapter one. Always a, 
I, she really hits fear a lot in this, which is funny given that we read the places that scare you and how tied in to the fear that it was. But I always, uh, I, I appreciate the sincere reminder of the fear that can arise from this practice inside of us. So I really appreciated this as a little, as a little opening to the book, I guess. I think it's a good warning to people who are fresh to uh, really opening themselves up and learning to practice that loving kindness to themselves. Um, Fear hmm? is interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I have a thought now. Uh, fear, it, it, you know, on like the surface of things, you wouldn't expect fear to be one of the things that happens when you, you know, partake in like a dharmic exercise or decide I'm going to meditate and figure out what's up with my brain. You know, like you, you think you're going to be like, oh, I'm so distracted and whatever, but like fear is in there and we don't know that it's going to be in there because we don't like to acknowledge fear mm -hmm. because it's, it's scary, you know? And if we, if we hide from it, uh, then it can't get us. But like, there's, there's, there's only so much you can do before you have to accept that truth that, I mean, fear is part of being alive. It's part of yeah. attachment. So like, it's, it is, I think, a very, uh, not just good, but like wise thing to bring this up. I mean, like Pema has always been really straightforward about, hey, sometimes shit's bad and like you can't make that better, but what you can make better is how you handle that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 100%, so I, I, yeah. I appreciate the fact that she's just right up front. Listen, you know, sometimes it's bad. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, she points out, I think, because I, I definitely experienced this, especially earlier in the practice, how inspiring I felt it, it felt to spend time meditating, right? Like, it was really refreshing and just, like, the energy and the, um, not that it's not refreshing still, but... <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. just, um, just the newness of it was very like, oh, this is amazing. I really want to dive into this and learn so much more. And as she puts it, like it, it can spark that enthusiasm in us, but it's inevitable that as we go through it, we're going to experience that fear. And like you said, and she says, it's a part of being alive and it's something we're all going to share in this process. And we can't think we're doing it wrong if we're afraid. If we find ourselves like afraid to challenge ourselves, challenge the ego, challenge our perceptions or our ability to expand ourselves and how compassionate we are. But those are all going to be real challenges we face, right? Oh, yeah. So. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, We're I have something bad, but I'm in a very loud place. Okay. I'm just kidding. I'm trying to walk off the next block. Just be loud about it. It's okay to be loud. We'll, we'll live. Well, if someone else is louder than me, then you won't very much be able to hear them. Um, just eat eat the phone. Eat it. Eat the phone. Okay. Um, can we have a now? Yeah. Hopefully, maybe. So uh, I wanted to kind of expand because we're talking about fear in the Dharma and, you know, meditating and conjuring. But I think something interesting that don't, I mean, I'm hoping she'll touch on this later somewhere in the book. Mm -hmm. And also maybe she did in the other book we read, but I didn't read, you know, I joined in pretty in that one. So, mm -hmm. it, but a big thing that I've noticed culturally is that fear is often buried under another emotion like one of our responses to having fear like normally you take action but you either yeah escape the thing or somehow address the thing that's making you afraid right but we also have a lot of incidents of 
people masking fear with anger or with, I mean, I think anger is very common. People respond with aggression instead of anything that's actually going to help fix the source of the problem, the thing that they're actually afraid of. But because we think about it as anger, we experience it as anger first, is very difficult to address the actual fear underlying mm -hmm. the People often take wrong actions or in things that won't help and not wrong actions, but just things that wouldn't necessarily benefit us. And then underlying all of that is still that, that same fear. Mm hmm or and some people carry it as anchor forever. They never really get past that. But even outside of, I mean, I guess that the whole point is then if you meditate, you can eventually encounter that. It's like why not feeling it, paying attention to your body and knowing, seeing what's really going on and eventually seeing the truth is that really is just kind of living with You cut, um, you cut out Lee. Are you done? Or did? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't know if you'd stop talking or if <laughs> yeah, I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no. I stopped. I okay. stopped. I'm walking. Oh, no. So. <laughs> um, I highlighted a couple other things, but I'm trying to remember exactly what I thought that would provide to the conversation. <laughs> oh, I like, I liked this. Please don't go. Um, somebody who was teaching her about meditation techniques and guidelines said to her, but please don't go away from here thinking that meditation is a vacation from irritation. Wow. <laughs> it absolutely a, is not. Yeah. It is not. <laughs> My, my grandma, that language is very similar to how my grandma talks about when bad things happen to you, you'll say there's a lot of irritate, <laughs> which I think is like the, I, I, I you know, this person is and what the context of it is. It just reminded me of how when uh, misfortune befalls somebody and it's not like so extreme, you know, mm -hmm. like some nobody died or severe illness illness or something like that but just like things that stress you out happen she'll say a lot of irritate <laughs> it's a lot of irritate and just... i'm <laughs> maybe the perspective of that as well that it's like they're not actually these life-changing world-ending events all of these things that we complain about it's just irritation get some perspective you know Mm -hmm. I appreciate her taking the time to um, yeah the world's a ton of irritation but then she takes the time to really hit you with the reality that you're probably she doesn't put it this way necessarily but you're going to learn a lot about yourself probably you didn't really want to think about or accept <laughs> I, I've personally been presented with my own flaws during meditation and been like I don't want that to be true, but it is. <laughs> um, I'm trying to be kind to myself as I, was, as I work through them. Is interesting. Uh, I think and maybe I am applying too much thought to people looking into meditation. I'm mostly just referring to myself when I first started meditation. I expected... I suppose to be free of not just irritation, but anxiety. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going to start meditating and I'm just going to be so at peace all the time. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah, I still beat myself up too for having <laughs> more anxiety than I think I should have. But I did notice a really big difference between properly meditating. And for the last, like, uh, 
I would say the last year has been more focused on that, but I had already kind of been doing some of these things without consciously thinking of them in this Buddhist framework Mm -hmm. from some months before that as well. And I think the way that I handle the anxiety is definitely different. The anxiety is still there, but being much quicker at recognizing that I'm experiencing anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. And being able to say, oh, that's all it is. And that I can kind of like have a conversation with myself that I don't need to listen to some of these thoughts and the things that I'm worried about yet and may never actually happen at all. Uh, a lot of them do come true and then they have happened, which is, I think, for myself, one of the biggest hurdles of, you know, I'm worrying about something happening and then I'm right. It <laughs> makes it very difficult to overcome yes. the anxiety because my anxiety has accurately predicted the future many, many, many times. You get that confirmation bias and like, ha ha! <laughs> but, but here's a big difference. If you can recognize that you're right, that thing is going to happen, but feeling bad about the thing happening doesn't help make it better. And I'm like slowly shifting into preparing for the eventuality of something unpleasant or bad but trying not to let that feeling overtake me. Trying not to let that affect too much in the present moment to the point that it's preventing me from enjoying Mm -hmm. or preventing me from seeing other things clearly, like obsessing over that particular future moment that will, you know, most likely come to pass, but and then remembering too that they're in the moment after that happens. It's I not think... just mm-hmm. that. It's like some life going past that moment as well. If you can kind of keep that perspective. Even on another level, personally for myself, um, because I have a lot of generalized anxiety where it's not necessarily about anything. It's just in my stomach, and that's how I feel. <laughs> um, and so for me one of the insights I've been able to gain from a mindfulness and meditation practice is being able to more quickly discern, okay, this is just a bodily reaction I'm having. I'm not, and being able to like, okay, I've calmed my thoughts. I am trying to be open and I just kind of am able to not try to just turn anything into something to be anxious about because my body says we should be anxious about something. Anything, pick something. And so uh, before I I did, and I still struggle with this sometimes, is that because I'm having the bodily reaction, my mind is like, oh, what are we anxious about? Let's pick something. And so. That's, yeah, I was about to say that because, uh, I mean, there's always something to be anxious about. And if there isn't, then the mind will come up with something. Yeah. And so I'm often having a physiological response, no matter, like, outside of my control. And so practicing that mindfulness and that meditation is so important to me as a person because then I can identify this is a physical response. Is there something I can do to help halt it instead of seeing it as something, okay, I got to figure out what the problem is in my mind. And sometimes the answer is, a lot of the sensory techniques that you get taught in cognitive behavioral therapy. Like some oftentimes with little kids, I'll be like, you want a piece of ice <laughs> because sucking on something cold in their mouth or, or holding something icy can really like take you out of a thought cycle. And I find that shocking my system sometimes similarly will get it out of a, a knot. I'm not, I don't have a good word for it. <laughs> the tied up knot in my stomach will unravel if I can do something to shock it. (laughs) Hmm. Anyway. So. Yeah, I often, um, I have caught myself recently uh, sometimes being anxious and then actually being able to step back and okay, how 
dreadful or how terrifying is this sec- uh, is this situation in actuality and then mm-hmm. I, I realize oh, wow this is just uh, some everyday happenstance and it's not as bad as your gut makes it out to be right yeah and then Pima goes on to tell a little antidote about a dude who went to go meditate or something and he freaked out about a snake Freaked out so hard, he just stared at it until he was enlightened. (laughs) Uh, And then he went and slept. And then he was like, was there actually a snake or was I just scared of the snake? And there you are. (laughs) That's my summary of the antidote. (laughs) Um... And then she gets into the conversation of how, you know, no one ever tells us to stop running away from fear. We are very rarely told to move closer, to just be there, to become familiar with fear. I think in the kind of community that we run around in here in the in the server, obviously we might hear that language more often of like, sit with your fear, spend time with it. Um, but definitely in a day-to-day world, I think it's like, yeah, run away from your fear, ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's not even a conscious thing necessarily, right? People mm-hmm. probably haven't directly said that to you, but we have a lot of things like, oh, something bad happened. Just, uh, why don't you just go watch a movie? Why don't you just go... Yeah, distract yourself. Games. Yeah. It's going to distract them. And then the immediate bodily response, even beyond that, right? So much, how much we see people turning to substances or, you know, going partying or something to forget about their problems and they'll even use that language too to forget yeah right and like this thing is always following them around and how many people do you meet where they're doing things like that and they're laughing but then they have this like you can feel underneath that yeah for sure Sooner or later, we understand that although we can't make fear look pretty, it will nevertheless introduce us to all the teaching we've ever heard or read. And I think that's an interesting claim. Um, I'm interested to see how she furthers that thought process throughout the book. And uh, and then she talks about some good, good, good words we all know about. Buddha nurture, love, nature. Love, courage. These are code words for things we don't know in our minds, but any of us could experience them. Once again, I thought I'd like to see expanded fun, so we'll see how that goes. She says these are words that point to what life really is when we let things fall apart and let ourselves be nailed to the present moment. I think nailing myself to the present moment is really, uh, really a kind of a grap in my mind, very graphic detail. Like, I'm imagining literally being nailed to a moment and then there's blood and blah. But that's how my brain do. Then that's the end of chapter one. (laughs) Oh, that was quick. Yeah. So, any other thoughts? How are we feeling about the book? I like the book. Max is in. They're down. I mean, it seems to be, yeah. I mean, she's she's she, those those themes she talks about are obviously well. Uh, many of these can also be found, of course, in the other book we read. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, I guess it's it's just her thing to repeat these things in different words. Yeah. But mm. oftentimes I think a lot of the books we read are go through kind of hit it that way. Um we were sort of getting the same thing from Thich Nhat Hans uh writing of it's talk about the thing, reiterate the thing, repeat mm. the thing. Um yep. and I think that's a classic technique so that it really sticks in your brain and stays there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Repetition isn't a bad thing, per se. <clears throat> well, then it's state the problem, explain how we got there, and then conclude with something that goes slightly deeper into the same 
right? Yeah. Like, it's, it works. Mm -hmm. If it's done well, people don't do it well. (laughs) I guess I'm interested to see what development we can get on some of these thoughts, because I, Mm -hmm. I, I, I like what she had to say. I think a lot of it is things that have become a <laughs> big bee just ran into my face. <laughs> a bee! A lot of it is <laughs> things that, yeah, they're really happy today. All this, um, but the things that she said were things that I've come to be like, yes, that's, this is apparent, right? This, this is stuff that I know to be true from the experiences I've had and how I've been thinking about things recently. And, I wonder how much will she go more into that or like a different direction. And that's just what she wants to use as an underlying like idea. Mm-hmm. Something mm-hmm. we just could keep in our mind and think about as we read this. But I think it can go a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right, go team. 